whenever you go to achieve a long-term objective that the external world has a say in, throw routine out the window because the world is going to hit you with punches all the time. You're going to have to break routine, right? This is why the some of the highly, highly, highly self-disciplined people sometimes have trouble achieving long-term things because it's hard for them to break routine, right? Rich Devinny, welcome to the show. How are you, my friend? It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. You are a fucking badass, man. You did buds at 22 years old, the SEAL team selection. That's right. That's right. Um, but I'm not as badass as some guys. I had an 18-year-old in my class. I mean, you know, so, I mean, I went through as an officer, so I went through four years of college and then and then went to buds. And so, but we had we had, we had had guys who had just gotten out of high school. They want to join the Navy. And, um, and they were 18. I had one 18-year-old dude who was my class, and this guy was... He was one of the fastest runners you've ever seen. I mean, he was a freak and he was a smoker, like an avid smoker. And I remember he'd like be puffing a cigarette and then we had to go for a run and he'd beat us all on the run. I mean, but he, he was just that I, at one point, and I want to get gross right at the beginning of our show here, but um, we were running on the beach as a class, right? And he had to go to the bathroom really bad. So he figured he'd just sprint ahead, you know, ahead of the class, run into the ocean because it was on the beach, go to the bathroom and then... And then as the class passed, he caught, he, he got back with us, right? That's how fast he was. He was just ridiculous. But 18 years old, unbelievable. Is that the youngest that you can do that? <clears throat> yeah, because uh, because in the in the States, you have to be a high, at least a high school graduate or have a high school degree or diploma. And that's usually around 17, 18 years old. And then you can go and, and, and then and then if you join the Navy right after high school, say you're 17, you go through your regular Navy boot camp and stuff. So by the time you hit the beaches of SEAL training, you're you're 18, but that's still, that's just still insane. So you can have those kids in America though. The ones that jump ahead a few years, you've got some child prodigy chess grandmaster that decides he wants to be in the seals at age 14 or something like that. That might happen in future. We'll have to wait my, I, I would, I would assume if, if someone's that far ahead academically, the seal teams of the military <laughs> is not their first choice. So, uh, I don't know if that's going to happen, but, uh, so what's it like you're 22 years old or, you know, you've, you're with someone who's 18. What's that like? Being going through something that grown men with hardened military experience for a lot of time, more life experience, more emotional stability, so on and so forth. What's that feel like? Were there any interesting lessons you think from doing it so young? Well, you know, it's interesting. I think I and I'm I don't know the exact. There's an age limit. In other words, you, you can't be any older than I think 29 or 30 if you want to be a SEAL. Now, I think that has to do with some some of the, just the physical aspects of it. I mean, it literally breaks your body down. You have to be young to do that because you're just bursting with testosterone. You know, I mean, there's a, in SEAL training, you do obstacle courses, right? And there's an obstacle course there with a bunch of high obstacles you climb up and do stuff. There's one obstacle called the slide for life. And it's about a, it's a four story tower that you climb up to the top of. And then connecting the, at the top of that tower, there's a rope that goes all the way down uh, about 100, 150 yards down to the to the sand, right? And you're supposed to climb on top of that rope and then slide down that rope to get down off that four story tower. It's called the slide for life. And of course, someone like me who hates heights, it's always it's it's tough to do. You just have to focus and do it. Anyway, there was a dude in my class I remember who jumped on the rope at the top of the tower, slid down only a, a couple feet, and then fell off the fell off the rope and f fell like almost four stories into the stance into the sand, right? And this dude's like, he, you, I were like, holy, holy crap, what just happened? It's like 10 seconds or so. He gets up and he brushes himself off and then keeps going. You can't do that when you're, <laughs> you can, you can, that can, you can only do that when you're young because your body just is so resilient. And so, so, so I think one piece is that you have to be young because of just the physicality of it. Um, I think, uh, you know, the SEAL teams and special operations holistically um, thrive on members who, can think through things, can 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 um, can uh, utilize some experience and and some knowledge, and kind of apply that to problems and solutions. So so going through the training young like that is actually I think necessary because you kind of get through that crucible that sees if you have these innate qualities, and then you go to a team, and then you're just a learner. I mean, you're a new guy for a while, and and so you're surrounded now by experienced dudes who, whereas they may not be as physically uh, resilient as you are at that age, you're still, they're the guys you're listening to. And so I think, um, I think that was the lesson you, it was kind of do this up front. I mean, you certainly get bonded with people. I mean, at 22 and 18, they're not too much difference, uh, you know, age wise, you know, but, um, uh, but you get bonded, you start learning about people, you get, 
you, you form this bond of people uh, with people who just go through the shared experience. And of course, that experience, whether it's the people in your SEAL training class specifically, or guys who've been through, you know, 20, 30 years ago, right? You all have that commonality. I'll, I'll talk to guys who went through, they were SEALs in the 50s or 60s, you know, and we can talk and we joke about the same stuff because we've all been through that. And even now I'm the old guy, right? Because I went through in, in the mid 90s. Now you got the new guys. I'll talk to SEALs today, you know, currently, and they just been through training and we can bond because we've been through the same. That shared experience is the common denominator, which is really cool. It seems to me, learning a little bit about you, that you, based on what I knew about the SEALs, I knew that the guys were really, really smart, but it seems like you were very well read as a kid. You were doing visualization and manifestation and stuff. That didn't strike me as the sort of person whose first port of call would be to go into the SEAL team. Is that well is that wrong yeah. for me? Is that is that, is it common for someone who's who's got these sort of academic inclinations to do that? Well you have a mixture. I mean again I don't think there are any dumb guys. I mean we, we would joke. I would you know of course as as brothers in arms we'd call some of our members dumb, right? But but you had a you had the you had a kind of a, 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 a spread. I would say though that spec ops guys tend to trend towards the more intellectual, well read kind of uh, guys who just kind of think differently, because again, the job of special operations. I always said that you know, the, the Navy SEALs and that job is not like the movies and the TV shows. It's not like a bunch of door kicking folks who just run in and shoot guns and all that stuff. They're they're masters at skydiving. The job is really to be a master of uncertainty. It's to be able to drop into an environment that's deeply uncertain, unknown, and volatile. So in the military, you call it VUCA, V U C A. Uh, volatile, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous environments, VUCA environments, right? The job of a SEAL is to drop into those and immediately start performing, right? And so to do that requires a level of, A, uh, well, an ability to calm oneself and think through uncertainty, challenge, and stress, but also a level of, um, of knowledge and experience to be able to, uh, or open-mindedness or whatever you call it, to be able to say, okay, what can I apply to this environment? And that takes a lot of learning. I mean, I, there were, you know, because it's so hard to get to SEAL training in the first place, um, and the officer path is is even more competitive than the enlisted path. I had guys in my class. There was the one guy in my class. He he had a a, a college degree in rocket science, um, and he could he he enlisted in the Navy to become a SEAL, right? So um, so yeah, very intelligent guys mostly. Um, they, there are there are some. Some of those just big dumb guys who you you have carry the big weapons, you know, and we love them too. But uh, and we 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 tease them all the time. Um, but uh, but for the most part, yeah, a more a more intelligent force it, it, you'll find in in any special op special operations, whether it's the Navy SEALs, the Army, or even in the um in the UK SBS SAS. Uh, I mean, it's amazing. We work with those guys all the time, and we're so similar, right? Because it's just it attracts this type of mindset, which is. Um, I think a little bit more deep, deep thinking. What were some of the differences between you and the British Special Forces, if you noticed any? Um, I mean, very few. I would say that they they they're better drinkers, but even that, they were, <laughs> <laughs> we 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 still went toe to toe with them on that. No, I mean, you know, I mean, very trans transportable. I mean, or or kind of similar, because again, um, you're talking about units that have incredible incredibly tough selection criteria. Uh, the job is to do incredibly tough, dynamic, complex things and think differently. Um, and so we would, I mean, we would get on with those guys and whether it was the, 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 the Brits, the Germans, the Italians, the Israelis, I mean, all of us, it was always, it was cool because you just, I mean, you know, the difference was accents. That was it. <laughs> well, the thing yeah. is you guys, you're no matter where you're from, the end goal is the same. Mm -hmm. to be able to drop in, to deal with the uncertainty, to deal with the ambiguous situation. And they're, given the fact that everyone has the same genetic or almost exactly identical genetic starting points, there can't be an unlimited number of iterations that you can go from one point to the other. You guys That's need right. this outcome. So That's right. it kind yeah. of makes sense that you're going to have a framework that everybody feels uh, a little bit of um, homogeneity with. Yeah, that, totally. And I think that, that some differences might be environmental, right? The Navy SEALs and the SBS guys um, and the German comp swimmers, they, they're a little bit more similar because we're water, we kind of water focus, whereas the SAS, the Green Berets and um, the GSG guys in Germany, 
they're kind of the land guys, like the Army, Navy. So you have the Army, Navy stuff, which we always tease each other about. But ultimately, we're all friends. I mean, we all we all think very highly of each other, so it's really cool. What was some of the big lessons that you took from dropping into these environments? So, you know, the experiences that most normal people would have going into a client pitch in an office or something, the mm -hmm. volume has been turned up to 11 from that, right? Yeah. Like everything, yeah. the stakes are higher, the pressure's higher, the immediacy of your decision-making has to be higher. What were some of the lessons and the, the learnings that you took away from that? Yeah, I think most of those came probably after the fact or even, or maybe as I gained more experience as I got towards the, the latter part of my career and I began to have the opportunity to look back on what makes us who we are and I think I think the biggest uh, the biggest lesson is our ability to deal with stress, challenge, and uncertainty. To be able to process it in a way that allows us to think logically through it, and um, and that's born well. First, it's born of attributes. What you come to the what you come to the game with, obviously, because you can't make it through training without some of these innate qualities. But then that's hyper developed inside of a career, especially those guys who go to combat. Right there's a there is there is in fact a difference between spec operators who um, spend a career and they never get the chance to go to combat because that happens. In fact, that's the majority of guys. Maybe not now because we had 9-11 happen and we had the war on terror. And the guys who've actually been to combat. And, you know, I was just having this morning, I was just having coffee with, so Hank from the book, um, uh, you read about, uh, I just had coffee with Hank this morning. We were just talking about this idea that um, that the training ground, BUDS, Basic Underwater Demolition SAS SEAL Training, which is the crucible inside of which you go through to become a SEAL, that's just the ticket to get in, right? Um, and and then if you, if, you're, if, you, if you happen to have the chance, like we did, to go to combat, that's when the, a lot of the testing begins because that's when it's real. I mean, you go to BUDS and you can kind of say, well, they're not going to kill me. I mean, you know, I, I remember saying that a couple of times like, because I was like, oh, my God, I'm this is really tough. And I was like, well, they, they can't kill me. I mean, that's not, that's not their job to kill me. So in combat it's different. The, the, you, you are in gloves a situation where the, end, yeah, the, the, yeah, the gloves are off. And if you do, if you do something wrong, um, death could be the result. And so I think, I think the big lesson is, um, the, the ability to hyper develop your sense and, and kind of process by which you, deal with and walk through stress and challenge and uncertainty. And it's very similar. This is, this is, this is a similar to all spec ops folks and probably, you know, regardless of country, but in my neighborhood, for example, the quick example, because my neighborhood across the street from my house, there lives a seal down the road to the right. There's another seal down the road to the, to the left. There's another seal. Right. And, um, and I remember my wife saying, Hey, I'm really glad these guys are in the neighborhood because if, if you're gone and something would happen, I know I could go to these guys and they'd act the same way you act. And I say, what do you mean by that? It's like, I just, I tell them and they do immediately calm down. And they start working the problem, right? Because that's our, that's what we do. And you hyper develop that ability. And that translates to every context of life. I mean, when COVID hit and we were all quarantined, I felt myself kind of like, okay, yeah, what's next? How are we going to, how are we going to step through this? There was not really a lot of stress or anxiety because it was kind of like, let's just walk through, let's, let's feel this out. So I think, I think that's a huge lesson that everybody comes away with. How many deployments did you do? Oh boy, I did about seven to Iraq. I did about five to Afghanistan, and I did uh, some other ones around the world. I can't really talk about. So, I mean, overall, I did about thirteen plus uh, deployments throughout my career. Yeah, twenty-year career. So, so after you've done that, and actually while you're doing that, you begin to reflect on some of the lessons that you've learned, and then what's what's this mind gym? thing what happened with that yeah so that so so the mind gym the reflection happened really uh most a lot of the reflection began when i was doing that so what happened was i i was i had the opportunity to get to to select and 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 be well be chosen and go through the selection process for one of our very specialized seal commands um and th at this particular command we took they took seals from other commands and then you went through your own selection process and you were part of this one hang on so you've got the hardest guys <laughs> that have gone through one of the most difficult selections and then you put them through another even more other. difficult selection tell me about that what's what's that about well it's 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 so that they can actually do the job required by this this specific command um and there's still about a 50 percent attrition rate and so and so i was there for a little while and then they put me in charge of the selection process and the training process for that command which is really where i began to kind of reflect because i said okay this is cool 
I get to look back and, and look at it from kind of a 50,000 foot view. So there are a couple things that happened in there. First, one of my jobs when I took over that position was to look at um, operator resilience. Um, how how effectively were we, were we performing on the battlefield and how effectively were we actually being able to um, come back uh, you know, and and be resilient, be anti fragile, kind of kind of heal ourselves, but reintegrate back into life. Yeah, after they that. re- that's a great, yeah, great way to put reintegrate and um and grow from it. And um and so on that on that angle on that pathway, um, I was also I kind of I, I and a couple other guys really felt like we were we were fine from a physical standpoint. In other words, um, benching more bench pressing more weight or running the mile faster wasn't going to get us any better, right? It, it had no, no applicability to combat. Um, where we thought the, the, the gains could be made was our, was our brain, was our mind, and how we could better, we could better develop a relationship between our, 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 our brain, our physiology, ourselves, understand ourselves, understand our internal mechanisms, and, and develop that relationship. So the Mind Gym was really an exploration in some things, some techniques, some, some equipment, so that we could start exploring that relationship. You know, how can we more effectively um, hack into our our sympathetic and parasympathetic systems? How can we go from a sympathetic response to a parasympathetic res- response almost instantaneously? Because that's recovery, and I used to call it micro recovery. How can we re- recover between gunfights? Because when you're doing that, when you're shifting your physiology that way, um, you are changing the chemical and biochemical response in your system. Right? Sympathetic response, especially high stress ones is going to induce cortisol, right, into our system, which again is a necessary chemical, but also damaging to a degree if it's if it if it's in your system long enough and it shuts down other kind of critical factors in your system. When you're releasing cortisol, for example, um, I mean very simple things, your your hair stops growing, your your nails stop growing, um, your immune system starts to operate in different ways. Um, you stop creating saliva, which is why we get dry mouthed when we're when we're stressed. Um, but there are some there are some things that your your body basically begins to cipher energy to very critical components and elements of your system, all necessary for survival in stress. Right. However, our body is also designed to shift to the parasympathetic. The parasympathetic system is the recovery, the rest and recovery. That's when we begin to make DHEA, for example, in our system. DHEA is a rebuilding chemical and, and neurotransmitter that 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 not only repairs the damage done by cortisol, but also starts to, it's a, it's a, it's a fi- foundational elements of, of testosterone and estrogen, for example. So, so we can, in fact, um, through breathing, through visualization, through, um, through certain visual techniques, we can actually hack into, we can deliberately move our systems from sympathetic to parasympathetic. And so, so we started exploring some ways that we could help operators operators trained to do that. And that was the inception of the Mind Gym. I don't know where the Mind Gym is at this time because I was in charge of it for maybe 18 months and I moved on. Um, but it was certainly a, a cool process to kind of think through and, and talk about um, while we were there. So not everyone's going to need to be able to calm down in between two gunfights or between dropping out of some vehicle into a combat zone. But let's say that someone has just had an awkward conversation with the boss or a really bad day at work and they've got a a 10 minute drive home or maybe a walk home or maybe they're sat on the bus what yeah. would be your favorite strategy that you could give someone or one of your favorite strategies look here's something that you can do to get yourself into a mode where you're going to be able to be with your kids to be with your, your yeah spouse. yeah well there's so there's two parts of that question i'll hit the second part for uh first okay because i think it's important there's the recovery part which is what you're talking about and that's can I kind of effectively come off of this hype, this stress, and kind of start to rebuild my system, get myself to a different framework, and reflect appropriately? Um, I mean, visually, some a visual tool immediately that someone can use if they're if they're feeling this is is open gaze, right? This is like when we get stressed, we start to focus, our pupils dilate. So if we say, for example, look at a horizon or look at something, and then just open our gaze, which means we start to notice our peripheries. We're not staring at anything anymore. We start. That's been proven to start shifting ourselves into parasympathetic, you know, coming off of sympathetic, um, breathing techniques. Um, when we hold our breaths, right. Um, we start to, uh, the longer you keep your breath held, you start to feel anxious, right? I mean, we all know this. You start to feel like, Oh my God, I got to breathe. That feeling of stress and anxiety is not, is not in fact, because our body is seeking oxygen. It's because our body is getting, um, overdosed with, uh, with carbon dioxide, right? 
And so one of the ways you can start to um, bring yourself, shift yourself is to do what's called CO2 blowout breathing. This would be simply uh, box breathing, but in a different style. So we say um, inhale for two seconds, hold for two seconds, exhale for four seconds, and then hold on that bottom for four seconds, right? That's CO2 blowout. That's some ways you can do it. And then I think one of one a really important way, a cool one, especially if we're driving home or on the on the 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 tube or whatever, and we are on the bus and have and have some time is visualization. Visualization, our brains ap apply different neurotransmitters and chemicals and biology to different situations we're in, and those situations that bring us joy and comfort and peace come with that. The reason why we feel that is because we're getting a burst of really cool, powerful chemicals. Um, we can, in fact, visualize effectively those same situations and induce that same chemical response. It's the same reason why when we, when we think about bad experiences, we get triggered and we get bad chemicals. This is the root of PTSD. The, the root of PTSD is, is folks who continually get triggered by a, remem by, a, by a memory of a bad experience, right? So they're, it's almost like they're reliving it, but they almost are because physiologically they're getting that, the, that, those chemicals. You can do the same thing with great experiences and, and great visualizations. I, one of the things I used to do is, I, you know, my boys are 16 and 14 now, but when they were little, they used to, they used to nap, take naps on my chest. I used to just uh, lay on the couch and they'd nap on my chest. What, I mean, such a wonderful bonding feeling when you can do that with a child. Um, and so I used to visualize that, you know, and I'd start feeling what that felt like. And I'd get that chemical release, right? And, and it's a way we can start recovering. So, so in the recovery way, you can do those things. But there's another, I think, piece of this that we should talk about that's important, and that is how do we, how can we more effectively march through an environment of stress, challenge, and uncertainty? And that you can use some of the same tools to do that, uh, because what what we have to understand. So so we have to kind of get into what fear is. All right, fear when we're afraid, and our amygdala starts to kick in, and we start to get that fight or flight. What happens is our our, our frontal lobe, our conscious mind, is starting to come offline a little bit. Okay. Um, and if it, if, if, if the more afraid we get, the more the amygdala starts to get hijacked, we can actually get into what's called amygdala hijack, which means we're, we're just operating without thinking. We do something without thinking. That is our, our frontal lobe, our conscious mind is, is almost completely offline and we're just acting, right? Um, not necessarily the best response when you are, when you, when you're, when it's your job to, you know, operate when you're scared, right? And so, so what, the way we can translate this into regular regular life is first we can deconstruct fear. Okay, fear is ultimately two things combined. It's anxiety plus uncertainty. All right, um, when you have both, you can have one or the other without being afraid. Right, you can be anxious without being uncertain. That might be I'm giving a presentation next week to my boss, and you know I'm anxious. I I know my boss. He knows me. I know the presentation. Um, I know what I know what's going to go on, so I'm not uncertain about it. I'm just a little anxious. Okay, I'm not afraid. I'm just anxious. You can be uncertain without being anxious. Okay, well that's every kid on Christmas Eve. Okay, so fear does not exist there. <clears throat> when you combine the two, fear starts to exist, right? And so the way you can begin, and when when fear starts to enter into your system, right, that's when we start getting the amygdala uh, response, and our frontal lobe starts to want to go offline, right? So the the way to manage that is to is to attempt to buy down either one of those elements, either uncertainty or anxiety. The way you do that is first you recognize that uh, what they are. Okay, anxiety is internally focused. Okay, um, there's crisis which is happening outside and uncertainty which is all outside of us. Right, the way we're processing it is stress and anxiety. Okay, so that's internal. It's an internal response, and we can manage it by internal ways. Things I just talked about. We can do open gaze, we can breathe properly, we can get our breathing. That brings down our anxiety. So we're buying down one of those, starts bringing that conscious mind back online. Once we start doing that, we can begin to manage uncertainty. Now that's a little bit different because uncertainty is all external, okay? Um, but the way you begin to manage uncertainty is you begin to ask questions about your environment um, and process the answers to those questions. So one of the questions is, okay, what about this do I understand? Okay, out of all of this, chaos, what about it do I understand? And that list might be really small, but then you say, okay, from that list, what can I focus on in the moment? And then you decide something and you move towards that, okay? As soon as you do that, you create a dopamine reward in your system, which allows you to do it again and ask the question again, and then move again and get another dopamine response. So, so 
<clears throat> it's literally stepping through our challenge, stress, and uncertainty and moving through the stress. So an example would be in SEAL training, and I remember doing this, you spend hundreds of hours running around with big heavy boats on your head all day, all night, right? And I remember being under the, one of these boats and we're on the beach and I'm like, oh my God, I, I didn't know when it was gonna end, it was miserable, everything, every part of my body was hurting. And I said to myself, okay, there was this big sand berm that we were running next to. I said, I'm just gonna focus until, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna run until I hit the end of that berm, okay? Okay, that's what, and that's what I did. As soon as I did that, I created a dopamine reward, all right? It was a meaningful step for me. And once I got that dopamine reward, I was like, okay, now what am I gonna do? I'm gonna run to that, or I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna pick my next thing. And so we can manage uncertainty, first anxiety, and then we can manage uncertainty by constantly kind of looking at what that horizon, that next horizon is, making it as long or as short or as long as we'd like, right? Because it can be like, I'm just gonna make it to the next meal, or I'm gonna make it the next 10 seconds. Whatever meaning, whatever provides meaning for us, hitting that, hitting that goal, getting the dopamine reward, and then doing it at, all right? This, in fact, is what almost every one of us does unconsciously if we can think back to how we've made it through a really tough experience. We've basically chunked it in meaningful pieces that mean something to us, and we've just moved through. We've, we've just taken it step by step, and we've, de we've defined what those steps are. The, the, per the patient going through cancer will, will say when they're going through chemotherapy, I just, I, all I wanted to do was get through the next session, right? That was my goal, right? I talked to my buddy Hank, who's in the book, and he said when he was first kind of going through all of his stuff as a as a as someone who lost both of his legs, he's like he's like Rich. Sometimes I was just like, just make it to the next hour. That's it. Just make it to the next hour, and then I'll pick the next hour, right? So, but this is in fact neurologically what's happening was we're managing it. So, so I think long answer, but those are two pieces and parts of those questions that I think could help people. What about if you wanted to turn it on its head? What about if someone is too parasympathetic? and they need to get themselves into a more energized state. Have you got any strategies for that? Well, so breathing is a, is a, is a well, focus and breathing, right? So you can, if you focus on something, you're, you're actually starting to, you're, you're starting to shift a little bit. Um, but breathing is also something as well. You can, you can breathe more oxygen. So Wim Hof has some great breathing techniques where you're super oxygenating your system <clears throat> and you're, and you're getting more focused, right? And, um, and so, I'd have to look at some of the breathwork stuff, but there's a lot of good stuff on breathwork that can take you either way. You can get recharged. Um, I think deep fat, deep breaths that are fast will um, will help you get more focused. Um, visualization, you know, in the active sense, can help you get more focused. I mean, music is one thing that changes states, you know. And um, and I, I love Metallica. It's one of my favorite, and I love heavy metal, but Metallica is one. Of and Metallica, in some cases, relaxes me. It takes me off of, you know, but sometimes it fires me up too. I can use it for both things. Um, but yeah, certainly you can use music to get yourself, you know, fired up as well. So yes, you can go reverse. Have you got any idea what would be optimal for someone if they wanted to, let's say, give a presentation? I'm thinking about like a common situation that someone's about to go into that they're stepping into this into this environment but they need to have the right amount of energy, but they also need to be calm. It feels like a, a challenging balance to go through here. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the way you define that state um, would be alert but calm, right? Um, and so, and, and really what alert but calm is, and really the way our systems are designed, is it's, a, it's almost um, a wave. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a gentle oscillation between sympathetic and parasympathetic, right? In other words, it's not, you're not just one or the other. You're, you're almost kind of just almost in a sine wave, you know, going back and forth. And I think that's, um, I think that's going to be different that that type of, that type of state is going to, is going to be different in terms of getting there for every person. Um, but you almost want to be just, I think, excited, you know, kind of a, a calm excitement, right? I mean, I, the, the good news is all of us as human beings can draw upon our own experiences to figure out what this feels like for us. Every one of us has felt this. You felt a time where like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm fired up, but I'm like really calm and focused. I'm like, this is, I'm like almost in the zone. This is what Kotler talks about. That, that would be actually flow state. A flow state would in fact be that oscillation between the two, right? And so, uh, and so my advice would be think back to situations where you felt that and ask yourself, okay, what are those, first of all, what was the situation, right? Because you could probably get back into it. But what were those triggers that allowed you to get there and feel that way? It's almost like that, um, that feeling that you're you're just at the edge of your capability, but it's not too much and not too little to be bored. You that know? proximal um, zone, man, it's a hell of a drug. That's right. 
That's right. And so, uh, and so how do you get there? And I think anybody who's going, um, is, is, in is, is kind of going down pathways for the first time, it's going to take a while. I, I use public speaking as a, as a, an example. I, I left the Navy and I hate, I hated public speaking. You know, I just like, that's, I don't like the idea. I'm nervous. And I said, well, I should probably do that. I should probably do it more because I should choose something that scares me. And so I started doing it. And the first, first year or two, I would say of public speaking, I'd feel those butterflies. I'd feel nervous. I'd be like, okay, I don't know. You know, but then I, and I just kept on doing it. I just started clicking. And now, I mean, I, you know, before going up on stage, it's almost like I'm excited to get up there. I'm not overly excited because it's not like, Ooh, I want the applause, but I, it's, so I, there's a little bit of nervousness, but I'm, I just feel more flowy in it. And, um, and I think it just takes practice, you know? So, so anything we want to do, it just takes practice to get to that state. I love the suggestion of music. It's, staring everybody in the face like it's such an obvious solution what is yeah. a song that gets you Th think about anyone who's ever done a one rep max in the gym you shouldn't have done it to silence in fact right. here's a here's a cool thing for you so i have a buddy who's a, a british champion power lifter one of my best buddies and he has a number of songs that he only uses for pr attempts yeah and they're like sacred to him yeah. So he, he almost kind of accrues this mystical power. And if it comes on, if he's if it's in the car, the radio goes off, if he's in a shop, I don't think this sort of music would be played in the yeah. local supermarket. But um, right. yeah, and that he keeps them sacred. Yes. Um, and, and it's because this is a, associated with a particular type of state that he wants to get in. Yeah, they're trigger points. Um, and, and honestly, the good news is you can actually do this with your physiology as well. I mean, you can actually, um, if you... If there's music, for example, that charges you up, because again, I mean, you know, in a power lifting environment, you're going to have music accessible to you. You may not have that same music if you're going to give a talk to your to some people or <laughs> just listening or to whatever. some Metallica in the in the hallway <laughs> outside right. of the meeting room. Yeah. Although one time I did give a talk, and they're like, "Hey, we're going to play a song before you walk up. Do you have any experience? Like, play Metallica, right? And so they played Metallica. I was like, "Oh, that feels great, right?" So, but the 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 idea is you can actually, if you have that music that actually triggers you, gets you that way, you can actually start to do things physiologically that help with that trigger. I mean, you can, I mean, whatever it is, it, can, it has to be somewhat unique, something you don't do all the time. But I mean, if it's like, you know, pound your chest three times or, or do, I mean, snap your, whatever it is, whatever that physiological movement you can make, that's a little bit unique. Yeah. You can start attaching that to that particular trigger. And then you don't need music at all. Right. As you, you do it enough and you're going to get the same response um without the music right so so we can do this to ourselves we that's just have to like cool. you said that's really yeah, fucking have, cool it has to be unique though right because if it's like it's if it's like doing this like i do this to my beard all the time i can't it has to, it just like the, just like your buddy he will turn off the song um if he hears it any other place it's because he doesn't want to dilute that trigger um if you do if you pick something with your physiology it has the same thing you have to it has to be something unique that you won't dilute accidentally by just doing in everyday life right so yeah man so you talked about Stephen Kotler there, and we had him on earlier this year. Awesome guy. Really, really loved his book. You highlight the difference between optimal performance and peak performance. Obviously, his mm -hmm. was a primer on peak performance, and your new book, The Attributes, is drivers of optimal performance. How do you define the distinction between that? Yeah, he and I, he's a good friend. He and I, in fact, he and I met while I was running the Mind Gym. Uh, that's when I first met him and no brought way. him in. Yeah, in fact, uh, his his previous book, Stealing Fire, is uh, that, if you read that first chapter, is about me. Um, he and I wrote No fucking I wrote way. That, yeah, we wrote that chapter together. So, um, so, so we've talked a lot about this. And I think he, he would, um, he would say, he defines peak a little bit more broadly than I do, um, which is fair. And he does some awesome work. The way I define peak, I just, I try to think about elemental human performance. Who are we at our most raw and try to get down to some very simple semantics, because I think that helps people peak. If you define it is simply an apex, right? And it's an apex from which you can only come down. And the professional athlete, and it has to be scheduled and prepared for and planned for, right? The, the professional athlete, plans and, and, and conducts himself or herself their whole week to peak for their event at the end of the week, right? The American football player does that all week so they can peak for the game on Sunday, okay? Nothing wrong with it. Uh, not practical in everyday life and certainly special operations life because in special operations, you never know when the end is coming, okay? Or when the end is, uh, when the end is even near. So we perform optimally, optimally. Optimal performance is how can I do the very best I can in the moment whatever the best looks like in the moment, okay? Sometimes that best looks like peak. It looks like flow states and everything's clicking. It's awesome, right? Sometimes my very best in the moment, I'm going step by step. I'm head down. It's 
gritty, it's dirty, it's hard, it's ugly, right? Um, that is also performing optimally, right? And I think what optimal performance allows us to do is a couple things. First, <clears throat> it allows us to pat ourselves on the back for performing through challenge and stress, okay? Even though I just did that and it was ugly as hell, I'm st we still did it, right? And we, we used to joke, sometimes we do missions like, man, that was not pretty at all, right? But we did the mission, I mean, we got it accomplished. We did the best we could with what we had, right? So it allows us to pat ourselves on the back when things don't feel clicky and flowy and pretty. But more importantly, it allows us to approach performance in a much more, um, I think, responsible and healthy way, right? Um, I don't need to be peaking when I'm driving to the grocery store, okay? I can, I can basically manage my energy states so that um, I'm using exactly the amount of energy I need to in the moment, not too much, not too little, um, but, but conserving because when I need to peak, I have it. I can peak on demand. I can go up to a 10, you know, but then once I stay there for a while, I know I can come back down and in some cases have to come back down to a two or three. So I start to recover inside of my, inside of my day. Right. And I think if, if we think about our days this way, we can start understanding where we can actually in, inflict some of those micro recovery moments, right? If you're at work all day and you know, Hey, my afternoon meeting is usually a bear. This morning, things usually pretty, uh, pretty hard. But there's usually a mellow period in the morning or whatever, or in the in the um, lunchtime, whatever. You can start saying, "Hey, I'm going to modulate myself as I go, so that I, I I know when I have to be on and peak, and then I know when I can I can actually." And then you you if you get good at this, if you practice it, you don't even have to plan it ahead, right? You say, "Hey, I got a moment here. I'm going to take I'm going to take five minutes. You know, I'm going to I'm going to take two minutes at my desk to visualize before I walk into my next meeting. I'm going to take." 10 minutes on my drive home to listen to some really great music to get me in a great state so that when I get home, I can be right there with my kids and, and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not bringing what I have home with me. And so I think if we looked at performance, if we, if we look at performance from an optimal standpoint, it allows us to be more human <laughs> for the duration of, our, of, of, of life, which is inherently unpredictable. Yeah, smearing that peak performance across time, right? right? Because right. You, you're totally correct. Like the ability to move in and move out to speed up and to slow down, that is where the difference is going to be made because it's going to permit you, 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 you need to match the output to the demands. That's yeah. precisely what the analogies to workouts are fairly obvious here. But yeah. you know, if you're running a marathon, you don't go out at a sprint. That's right. And well, or you, you sprint in certain moments, right? You know, yes. and it, it, so I was working out with a, a buddy of mine. He was, he actually is a trainer. It was about a year ago, and he was making me push these sleds, you know, these weighted sleds, and um, and I, it was over about, of course, like fifty yards or something. And he was timing me, and I said to him, "I said to him, what are you timing?" He said, "Well, I'm timing your, I'm, I'm basically measuring aerobic versus anaerobic capacity. So I'm timing how fast, how much power you have when you start your push, and comparing that to with your power state as you get to the end of the fifty yards." And I said, okay, what are you, well, what are you, um, what are you finding? What, what am I doing? He said, well, interestingly enough, you, you come out when you, when you push out initially, you basically start at the same pace that you finish, right? It's even the whole way. Um, I said, what, well, how do you do it? He's like, I always start and I'm like, I like start really powerfully. And then I slow down as I go. And I said to him, he had worked with a, few, a bunch of seals. I said, what do you find seals usually do? He said, seals usually are like you. Um, they're much more aerobic in their approach. And it made sense to me because the Navy SEAL, what you train yourself to do is you never look at a situation anaerobically. You you look at a situation aerobically because you never know how long you're going to be going. You know, if you start a mission, you have an idea and you hope that the mission will have a certain duration, but you don't know what's going to happen. It could go, it could go for days, you know, you know, so, so you, you train yourself to always think aerobically. Um, and then that gives you the capacity to go anaerobic when you, you know, on demand. And I think we can think about life the same way. I did that today. I had a workout this morning and I pushed it far, far too hard. And anyone that's done the acid bath CrossFit workout, you know what happens. You cross that anaerobic threshold mm -hmm. and it's just a ticking, it's just a ticking clock. It's right. like, it's like watching an asteroid very quickly come for you. And you're like, I, yeah. there's, there's, there's a wall here. Okay, so we've distinguished between optimal and peak performance. And then there's also a distinction to be made between attributes and skills. Yeah, yeah. So this was the other part of when I was in running that training and selection. I had to, uh, I, I was tasked with more effectively articulating why guys weren't making it through, why we were losing 50% of these top guys. Because we, the excuses we had, the, the explanations we had were unsatisfactory. There were things like, well, they couldn't shoot very well. They couldn't do this. And these were experienced SEALs. Obviously, they could shoot. Obviously, they could do this stuff. 
this is when I began to separate these things because there's a difference. When we look at performance, we often focus on skills. And the reason why we focus on skills is because skills are highly visible and they're highly measurable. So skills, just to break it down, are not inherent to our nature, right? We, we, we're not born with the ability to shoot a gun or, or ride a bike or throw a ball. We learn to do those things. We're taught to do those things. And they direct our behavior in known situations and environments, right? Here's how and when to shoot a gun. Here's how and when to throw a ball or ride a bike. As such, they're very easy to assess, measure, and test. You can see how well anybody does any one of those things. What they don't tell us is how we operate when the environment becomes unknown and uncertain, when, when, we, when, we're, when we're deep in, un, in challenge, uncertainty, and stress, because it's very difficult, if not impossible, to apply a known skill to an unknown environment, right? This is where we lean on our attributes. Attributes are more innate, or they are innate, right? All of us are born with levels of situational awareness, of adaptability, of patience. And of course, they develop over time and experience, certainly, but we can see levels of the stuff in small children, elemental human performance, who are we at, we are at our most raw, which is what I'm interested in. And attributes don't dictate our performance. Attributes inform our performance, right? So my son's levels of resilience and perseverance, for example, informed the way he showed up when he was learning how to ride a bike. He's learning that skill. And he was falling off a dozen times, okay? So they inform how we show up. And then because they're hidden in the background, they're hard to assess, see, they're hard to see and assess and measure. Um, you can't necessarily sit across the table in an interview process when someone's trying to hire someone and assess someone's level of resilience or patience, right? Um, they show up the most visibly, visibly during challenge, uncertainty, and stress, which is why the laboratory I had was such a good one because everything about SEAL training is throwing guys in stress, right? So, so what I did in the book was I said, well, this is, you know, I, I kept on getting questions from teams and businesses. Hey, we keep on putting together these dream teams. Um, <clears throat> best salesperson, best marketing person, best lawyer, but whatever, best, 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 put them all together. And it works for a little bit, but as soon as the plan changes or there's a turn or things don't go as planned or, or insert, the teams start to fall apart. They start turning toxic. And they said, what's going on? I said, well, it's quite simple. You're, you're, you're picking your team based on the wrong things. You're picking your team based on skills versus thinking about attributes. These attributes are what tell us or are, 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 are what indicate our performance in uncertainty, challenge, and stress. And so, um, and so the good news is we have all the attributes, okay? But the difference in each one of us are the levels to which we have each. So adaptability is the one I usually use as an example. If 10 is high and one is low, I'm probably a level eight on adaptability. What does that mean? That means when the environment changes around me outside of my control, it's fairly easy for me to go with the flow and roll with it, okay? I just adapt. Someone else might be a level three, okay? Which means the same thing happens to them. It's difficult for them to go with the flow. Much it's less hard. tolerance, it's, yeah. Yeah, much less tolerance. Again, no judgment on where we show up. All of us, if we were to line up all the attributes like a row of dimmer switches on the wall, we'd all have different levels. Our lines would look different. No judgment there, okay? Because, you know, it'd be like judging our hair color. Um, the, the idea is, can we figure out where we stand on some of this stuff? So A, it can, it, it can give us information on how we perform, and B, we can start making some decisions as to whether or not we want to improve and develop certain attributes that we might not have a lot on, but we want more of. I had James Clear's Atomic Habits in my head while I was reading it, and I thought of, you don't rise to the level of your skills, you fall to the level of your attributes. Yeah. I would, I would, uh, I would, so I would say, I would say, I would add something because, because there's a saying in the teams, you don't rise to the level of your, uh, in stress, you don't rise to, to, you don't rise up. You basically fall to the, to the base level, right? So, so this is why training and skills is important, but, but we have to not overemphasize it. If, if you can do something at a very unconscious level, if you train so much that you can do it without thinking about it, it's, it's probably a good bet that when things get rough and ugly, you'll still be able to do that, right? And That's, that's almost like train. making a skill an attribute in a way. It's internalizing almost. it so much that it becomes second nature. The boxer that's slipping punches without consciously thinking of it. That's right. But we have to understand that if someone is, for example, inherently um, uh, unadaptable, okay, um, they can train a skill in a known environment all they want and become really good at, uh, at it in a known environment. As soon as the environment changes, though, that low adaptability is going to, going to kick in. So they may, in fact, not be able to execute that skill as, as deftly as they could in that known environment, right? So, so there, it's all interrelated. And I had thought about in, writing the book, I, I, I could talk about how these all interrelate and interplay, but it would have been a thousand page book and it wouldn't have been published yet. So um, so it's really just a basic intro on uh, the reader saying, okay, how does this show up for me in my life? 
And then if you are a business owner or inside of a team, how does this show up for my team? Because the best teams are made up of attributes that mesh, right? And 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 balance each other and support mutually support each other. That's the best team. So to to know this stuff is actually really good. Were you tempted to create a hierarchy at all? Or are there some that you think are fundamental and enable others to come out of them? You've mentioned adaptability a fair bit. It seems like yeah. that would be more of a foundational type of attribute than perhaps some of the others. Yeah, it, yeah, I did. I thought about um, uh, creating a hierarchy, but uh, what I recognize is that I, it was probably irresponsible for me to do that. Um, a, I don't have any psychological background, and B, I just think everybody's so different and so subjective. And the attributes play off of each other in very unique ways, right? So so someone who is um, who has low adaptability, for example, but might be high on open-mindedness, they might be perfectly okay. That, that, those balance well because the open-mindedness helps the adaptability, right? Um, someone who is, um, let's give another example, someone who is uh, low on, um, say, situational awareness, okay, um, but high on, um, uh, well, what's another one? Let's see, high on cunning or something like that. You know, that, that could play off of it. Um, someone who's uh, a little bit higher on uh, narcissism, but also high on humility. Wonderful combination there. You know, so, so again, the problem- They're with- not just seen in isolation, right? They're all <laughs> That's very right. That's interrelated. Right. That's right. Now, I don't want to dodge your question, so I won't. Uh, because I, because if you put my back to a wall and said, Rich, what are the most important? I would say from a human aspect and in life, I would say the grit attributes probably are, are, are probably edge out the other ones in importance. In other words, just to be a human in this world takes some courage, takes some adaptability, takes some perseverance, takes some resilience, okay? Um, the world changes. Everything changes over time. So that means we need to be adaptable. If you're not adaptable, you'll be a, you'll be a dinosaur, right? Not a frog. Um, there's going to be stuff that scares us all the time, right? If we're not, if we can't, if we can't be a little bit of courageous, we're going to be sitting in our houses, you know, for the rest of our lives, right? So I think the grid attributes, if I were to place them, if I were to eke one or a set of of attributes above the rest, I would eke that first set, that grit set above the rest but that's that's the that's the best i'll do just a little bit more scalable right it's just that's able right. to be a little bit more sort of diverse like that is there someone from your experience have you met someone that comes to mind as like the most gritty human or some of the most gritty humans that you've met any stories from back in the day well so again H- uh, hank and i were talking about this uh, when we we're having coffee um grit is also subjective and we both i mean we both would say i mean you know, there are people who are very gritty in certain situations who in other situations, you know, fall into puddles, right? Um, and who's to choose to, uh, who's to kind of place value on someone's ability to move through ch- challenge and stress? I mean, there's, there are kids in the children's hospitals who, have, who are fighting cancer who have more grit in their little finger than most Navy SEALs I've ever met in my life, right? I mean, so... Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think I've certainly met tons of people with tons of grit, but I mean, their grit is everywhere. I think every human being has has some of it in them, um, and there are stories abound of people who you're like, oh my gosh, how the heck did that person get through that? And um, and you look at their ability to kind of gut it out, and you're like, I, I don't know if I could have done that. I, you really admire and respect that. So so uh, so the answer is yes, I've met those people, but but they're all around us, and it's inside of us too. I got some buddies that are going through a couple of different fellas that, and mates that are going through like some challenges at the moment and I'm watching it unfold. So I get the benefit almost of being able to iterate on these learning strategic learning experiences each time I have a phone call or a text message or whatever. And mm-hmm. um, it's insane, man. Like yeah. the, the level of resiliency that they're showing is just like, it blows my mind. But yeah. on the flip side, it's very domain specific. Mm-hmm. You can imagine a guy who is absolute a, a, an animal on the the field of battle, but really struggles when him and his missus have an argument. You know, so you yeah. not only are the attributes themselves also interdependent, but within different domains, some Context. of them interact in a different way. Yeah. I got to, I've had this in my head ever since uh, we started talking. Have you looked into behavioral genetics much? I haven't much. I've heard of it. Yeah. But, Dude. Uh, but I've, yeah, it's one of those things I have on my notepad to, uh, to look wow. into. Yeah. So I think 
there's so much crossover between what you're talking about here. So the heritability of particular traits, right, right that manifest. Right. So how much is your height dependent on your parents' height? How much mm-hmm. is your de- likelihood for depression or schizophrenia or penis length or uh, like marital um, instability? How much yeah. is this heritable? And yeah. it, it maps so nicely onto the attributes and the skills model that yeah. – they don't dictate, but they do inform. They do inform. And th- this, you bring up a great point. So I want to I just go back to one point you brought up because I think it's important to hit, and then I'll hit this next one. The fact that you said you're, you're, being, you're on phone calls with these friends who are going through this stuff, that is of enormous importance, okay? Because a lot of these attributes, um, they also are enhanced by help by others. Others help us be more courageous. Other help, others can help us be more adaptable. Others can help us be more resilient, right? So... So if you are someone who's going through something hard, go find people, go find help. They will help you do it. And if you're a friend who has a friend going through something, be someone who can help them, right? So, so I think that's number one. <clears throat> number two, in terms of the, uh, the kind of nature or nurture part of this, I think, I think it's, it's really important uh, for us to understand. The way I would say, you know, I'm, I'm all for nature, uh, like how do I show up in the world? Okay. Um, but the way I would say it is this, we are all just like, odd, we're all human, right? So, ju- but just like cars, we're, we're different, right? So there's, some of us are Ferraris, some of us are SUVs, some of us are Jeeps. Okay. And it, there's no judgment. Okay. Cause the Jeep can do things the Ferrari can't do. And the Ferrari can do things the Jeep can't do. It behooves us to look under our hood and see kind of which vehicle we are, because we may be a Jeep that's been trying to run our Ferrari track. Know thyself, time, man. Right? Know thyself. Yeah. Now, the cool thing about our about this life that we've that we have is that if we are a Jeep that's running on a Ferrari track, we can do that. We can choose to be a Jeep running on a Ferrari track. But to run better on the Ferrari track as a Jeep, it, it'd probably be good to know what you can work on to run better on that Ferrari track as a Jeep. And you could be a Ferrari track running you could be a Ferrari running on a Jeep track if you want. It's up to you. Um, so what it provides is know thyself. What it provides is, is the ability to understand where you sit what your performance and how your performance looks in whatever niche that you found, and then make some decisions. Do I want to, am I, oh gosh, I, that's it. I'm in the wrong thing. I need to, I need to switch or you say, you know what? I'm in the right thing. I love this. I just know now why it's been such a struggle and I know what are those things I can work on. So I think you're right. Nature, nurture, we can, we can put ourselves into experiences that help develop these attributes that we're low on. Um, sometimes experiences are thrown at us without our, without our consent that help us develop these attributes that we're low on. Um, and we can use this, the, these, these types of experiences to kind of, you know, get better at some of these things. So we just can't, we just can't develop or learn an attribute the same way we learn a skill. Okay. It's not, it's not translatable. The, the, and a quick back of the envelope test for the audience members to, to decide whether it's a skill or an attribute because they could get conflated is to ask yourself, can I teach it or can it be taught? If the answer is yes, it's probably a skill. If the answer is no, it's probably an attribute, right? So the example would be, Chris, you said, hey, Rich, I want to learn how to shoot a pistol and hit a target, hit a bullseye every time. Well, I could take you to the range and teach you how to do that within two hours, right? That's a skill. Or you say, Rich, I want to learn how to be more patient, right? I can't teach you how to be more patient, okay? Um, To develop an attribute takes self-motivation, self-direction, and it takes a willingness for that individual to deliberately place themselves into environments that develop and tease that attribute, right? If you're someone who is impatient, who wants to develop patience, you must then go find environments that develop your patience, right? I don't know what that looks like. Maybe you go deliberately drive in London traffic, uh, or you go wait in the um, longest line at the at the uh, the grocery store, whatever it is. Or you have kids, that's a great one, um, to develop patience. But um, but you have to, It's it takes oneself. I can't teach you an attribute. Um, you have to You have to do it yourself. Dude, I had this guy on the show, Ben Aldridge. He spent a year, after he suffered with some really bad panic attacks and anxiety, he decided to do uh, voluntary exposure therapy, essentially, but for everything. Like, this guy did hundreds of them, whether it was wow. he, he had a fear of needles. So he created an anti-bucket list, all of the things that he really didn't want to do. He had a huge yeah. fear of needles, so he worked himself up to getting an- acupuncture all over his face. Had a wow. massive, massive fear of heights, so built himself up to walking on one of those 
um, overhangs that's got a glass floor on it. It's like there's yeah, some huge yeah. tower somewhere. Uh, he ran a marathon. He climbed Everest inside of his house going up and down stairs. Uh, he went up and spoke to strangers in the street. He waited in a queue. He drove, there's a, a ring road called the M25 outside of London, and he purposefully went and just sat in the traffic just yeah. to get annoyed, to develop yep. his patience. To be, So what you're saying aligns perfectly with that. I really want to dig into, because you know, people are listening and they think, I want some more compartmentalization or situational awareness or whatever yeah. um can you just dig into those principles of somebody looks under the hood they've done the self-inquiry everyone that's listening is radically sensible they're unbelievably keen to do this sort of stuff what are the principles i want an attribute or i, f- I find a deficiency or there is a lack that i really think my life would be better if i was able to improve in this particular area yeah. What What are those three principles again? Can you give us some examples? <clears throat> yeah. In fact, I so so I'll, I'll give you a general. I actually put workbooks on the website that someone can get, and they can Which actually is... it's uh, theattributes.com. Yeah, and you can go and there are workbooks for the grit attributes, the mental acuity attributes, and the drive attributes, and and it goes through each individual attribute and and gives you some tips and clues on how to develop that specific one. The overarching thing is to is to say to yourself, okay, I have an attribute that I'm low on and I want to develop. Okay, first of all, let's let's do some self examination and ask, okay, what is it? What are those environments and situations that I'm most uncomfortable in? Okay, so take something like um, uh, take something like well, let's let's just let's just use adaptability. Okay, um, I. I want to develop my adaptability, all right? So I need to understand what that looks like in my life, okay? Um, maybe I'm traveling, and when the plane is delayed or something, I get very anxious, you know? I, you know, I just, it doesn't sit well with me. Um, <clears throat> you may want to then, this is, this is radical, you may want to then say, okay, I'm going to develop this, so I'm just going to, I'm going to go to the airport and buy a ticket somewhere, okay? And I'm going to go to a new place, and I'm not going to do any, I'm just going to, I'm going to drop onto the ground, and then just figure it out. I'm going to just decide to do that. I'm going to go find a place to stay. I'm going to go get you, whatever it is. Um, put yourself into situations that actually test and tease that and develop that. Now, I want to um, warn people, like, you know, even courage. I want to warn people, you don't have to be extreme on this stuff. You can start small. If you are someone who, um, so courage is a is usually a common one. If you're someone who finds fear, you know, it feels fear uh, in talking to people. You're an introvert. Um it might be as simple as like you said that guy did. You know, you you just start start up conversations with strangers. You know, that is going to feel very scary to you. Um, here's the cool thing about fear, though, and um, and this is something we can all use. When we um, when the when the fear response gets gets initiated, when the amygdala begins to uh, to kick in, okay, we are we are given two choices, and we both we all know the choices: fight or flight. Okay. We've often heard of a third choice called freeze, but really what they found neurologically is freeze is simply an oscillation between the two. You're basically just sitting there trying to decide, all right? So that's really just fight or flight. Um, when we decide to step into our fear, to fight, okay? That means step into our fear. Um, as soon as we do that, we're, our bodies give us a dopamine reward, okay? Our bodies are designed to do that because we had to, the nature had to give us a reason to go find new food, go or find Or else we shelter. would always flee. Or, or else we'd always, or we'd waste away, right? I mean, so, so what we have to understand about fear and anxiety and all this stuff is that it's, it's designed to get our systems moving, okay? When we are hungry, our body begins to feel stressed and anxious. That is designed to get us to go out and feel and find food. Um, same thing when we're lonely. It's designed to get us stressed to go find out, find companionship, right? So, so we can begin, and so, so our bodies began to give us reward systems when we actually decided to do that. So if you are afraid, if you find yourself fra- afraid of things, um, all you need to do is just start testing yourself and and stepping, you know, stepping into those into those fears, and you'll feel a dopamine reward after it. I'm not saying that the act is going to be feel good, right? I I don't like roller coasters. Okay, when I decide to do a roller coaster, I'm not gonna I'm not saying that the roller coaster feels good doing it, but I am saying once I'm done with it, I feel great for having done it. Okay, I remember in college there was this girl I had a crush on, and I had a crush on her for a long time. And she seemed so unattainable. And I said to myself one day, I, you know, I said, I need to do something, right? And I saw her one night out. And so I went up to her and I asked her out, okay? And she said, no, I'm so sorry. You know, thanks so much for asking, but I have a boyfriend, right? So I didn't get, you know, they, 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 it's not a happy ending in terms of me getting the girl. But I still, to this day, am so happy I did it, right? Because I actually tried. I actually stepped into my fear. But think so, about how meaningful that situation is that yeah. decades later, 
you're still able to recall it. Yeah, but I, but here's the thing, Chris. I think every human probably listening to this can think of a time where they actually stepped into their fear. They did something that a little scared them, and they probably still feel good about it. Okay, they probably do um, because that's how powerful that's a dopamine hit that we're getting. And so and so now, <clears throat> I want to say fear is also designed to allow human beings to appropriately risk mitigate or assess risk, right? Sometimes the appropriate thing to do is flee, <laughs> okay? Or flight, right? Because it's never a good idea to fight a bear, right? So, so, but the idea is, can you get yourself into a position um, when you start feeling that fear where you can actually make that decision? Okay, is this something I want to step into? Or is this something, no kidding, I need to flee, right? So, um, but if you do decide to step in, you'll get that reward, you'll get that, that, uh, that hit, and you'll feel good and you just practice that just like this guy you just said um, uh, did. He was basically, he was practicing this stuff and I'm sure that he was able to continue to do it as he did it more because he was feeling the effects of that dopamine reward system. Does that mean that fear increases our vigilance? Is that, is that reflected in the, in the brain at all? <clears throat> so <clears throat> so it's an it's a interesting question that's a little bit complex because, um, uh, and again, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm a fan of neuroscience, but I'm not a neuroscientist. When we are, when we're afraid, when our when our body goes into fear response, what typically happens is we we narrow our focus. Okay, so in fact, our our vigilance goes away because we're focused on a threat. Um, this is why the alert but calm state is so important. When we're alert and calm, we are actually in a state where we actually have more vigilance because we're able to neurologically notice different things. Um, <clears throat> we, our brains, in fact, react faster when we are actually in that state. Um, it, it, an example would be if you're standing, if you're at a stoplight, okay, and it's red, and you're staring at it, waiting it to, to, you're staring at the light, waiting for it to go green. If you're staring at it and it goes green, you're going to respond and go. You'll actually respond faster. You'll actually hit that accelerator faster if you're actually not staring at it. You're actually just, it's in your periphery. Okay, and you, you you see it go green in your periphery. Your actually your response is faster. Now, I'm not I'm not uh, advising anybody to go drag race, by the way. Okay, but this is also why when we're riding our bike or running or something, and we're and a bug hits our eye, and it's like, oh my god, that bug! <laughs> hit my, we, you know, we blink, and we're like, oh my god, I can't believe I blinked right when that bug hit my eye. Well, we our body actually did that. You know, we were we were in a an open state, and our body saw before our brain saw. Our body said, oh, bug coming, closed the eye, so that you know, so it didn't hit us in the eye. So. So we are actually the alert calm state is the best for vigilance. Um, when we were when we were in a fear state and we're, we we it, we tend to narrow focus because our bodies are designed to focus on that threat and and address it and then and then get out of it. So so it's a little bit of a complex answer. I understand. One of my favorite attributes that you go into is humor, actually. Yeah. Which I, I think yeah. would have been a surprise maybe to some people. It makes sense, but you wouldn't when you're talking about <laughs> optimal performance. Humor yeah. perhaps doesn't come up as one of those. Can you dig into that for me? Well, yeah. Again, we're talking about neuroscience again and and neurobiology because what laughing does. First of all, laughing is involuntary. It's like sneezing. Okay, if you laugh, it's not. It's because you just you you did. All right. And, you know that's why comedians are such a gift, right? Um, when we laugh, we get three powerful chemicals uh, injected into our system: two neurotransmitters and one hormone. Okay. Uh, the first neurotransmitter is dopamine. Just talked about that. That's a hugely powerful one. Says, "Hey, this is good. Keep doing this." Um, the next one uh, is uh, endorphins. Okay, endorphins are the human body's equivalent of opiates. Okay, so they mask our pain. Runners high and things like that. That's endorphins designed by nature to make us the endurance creatures that we are. Okay, that's why endorphins exist. Um, so we get dopamine. We get endorphins, and then we get oxytocin, which is a hormone. Oxytocin is known as the love hormone. Okay, it's um. It's a bonding, binding chemical between human beings. We get bursts of it when we, when we embrace, when we, you know, human touch, when we have a great conversation, when we shake hands, when we acts of physical kindness, acts of kindness between human beings induce oxytocin. It's a bonding chemical. So when we laugh, we get all three of those involuntarily, right? <clears throat> Laughing makes us feel, feel better, okay? Um, because it's involuntary, because we get bursts with these chemicals, this is why um, sense of humor is one of the most desire, desirable qualities when you're looking for mates, either male or female, right? Because, because it's, a, it's a signal between humans that, hey, when things get tough, I will, I will bring you up. I will lift you up. Neurobiologically, I'll make you laugh, okay? I've never seen a high-performing team, a successful one, 
that hasn't had at least a couple class clowns. You know, that, that the, the people who make jokes right when things are bad, right, and bring everybody up. And again, humor as an attribute doesn't mean you have to be that class clown. You don't have to be the person making the jokes. You just have to be someone who's able to laugh, right? Because if you're able to laugh, it will get you through. And oh, by the way, we just talked about courage. This is why laughing, this is why humor is also a hack into courage. Because when you laugh, you're getting dopamine. Well, dopamine is the same reward you get when you execute a step into what what scares you. So this is why anybody and anybody could have this uh, might have an, uh, an example in their lives. If they had, if they were, if they could think of a time they were scared of something, and then someone made them laugh, like really made them not like a <laughs> like a fake laugh, but really like a laugh, they they felt braver automatically. You know, they felt they felt better. That fear started to dissipate because they got that reward system. So laughter can also be a hack into courage as well. Did you guys use morbid humor a lot? The- I tell you, Chris, I, people ask me what I miss the most about the teams, and it's the humor. I mean, I remember, I mean, we let it, but you, you, that starts in buds. I mean, in buds, it's, there were some of the most miserable times, and we were laughing until we were crying. I mean, it was that funny. Um, so, yeah, we, all the time. I mean, this is where um, the, I think these teams that do really, you know, people always think, you know, these firefighters, cops, spec ops, military folks, they have this dark humor. Um, it's, it exists for a reason because when you do dark stuff, you need things that help you get through it properly. Well, yeah. it's a performance enhancer and a coping mechanism in one and a right. team building exercise. That's right. That's right. And I know, I mean, I, unfortunately I've been, I've been to far too many funerals in my day. Um, but, uh, but even at funerals, when, when you're, when you're honoring someone and remembering someone, those people who can remember them in a funny way and make people laugh. You, you feel so good. You know, you feel great about it. You, it, it helps you cope because this is, and this is, again, this is neurobiological, which is cool. What about decisiveness? I think this is something that a lot of people want. We have a paradox of choice at the moment, far too much stimulation, <laughs> far too much information to work out what it is. I don't know what I want to do. How can yeah. someone develop their decisiveness? Decisiveness is really all about understanding, um, how you're how how effectively you're bringing in information and then to what level to what to what extent you're comfortable deciding to do something with a certain level decisiveness is the the ability to make an effective decision with efficiency and speed okay and those two last words are actually are actually the most important part of decisiveness because someone can be good at making decisions but it's like a long process all right decisiveness really kind of kind of almost bridges into this thing we call in the military the 80 20 rule where you, you are never going to get 100% of the information that you need to make an appropriate decision. It's almost impossible, especially in a military environment. But most life uh, situations, you're not going to get 100% of the information. So the idea is to get as much information as you can in the moment. Okay, what that percentage looks like? Um, and then make a decision and, and move. And again, when you make a decision, what people have to understand is, is um, it's final, but, not, but might not necessarily be permanent, Okay. Um, so in other words, we're going to make a decision and we're going to move into that decision. We're going to execute, but I'm also going to buttress that with some accountability and ask myself after I make that decision, is this working? Is this not? We may have to change, right? So it's not, so, so final is not the same as permanent. So you can be decisive, you can make decisions that are final, and then you buttress that with accountability so that it might not be permanent. No leader, no true leader that any of us think of as leaders aren't such, are, are, are people who are, are, are long protracted decision makers you know that you know decisiveness is a leadership characteristic that most human beings really honor and, and look for i think a corollary of that is the ability to do task switching quickly yes you know yes. again too much stimulation too much information we were not designed to consume the entire world's news yeah instantly 24 hours a day what about task switching? How can people reduce the lag time? It's Stephen Kotler talks about this, that if you knock yourself out of flow, you're looking at 20 minutes at least yes. before you can get yourself back in. How can people maximize their, their focus and their ability to move between different tasks? Well, definitely put away the distractions that, that, um, that don't matter in the moment. I mean, again, we were talking about a neurological thing. Our, our, our minds are neurologically jumping between contexts. And so when we're, if you and I are having a conversation and suddenly I have my phone and it beeps, right? my brain has just switched. Even if I haven't taken my eyes off of you, my brain has just jumped, right? And sometimes that's the equivalent of going from a library to a soccer, to a, to a football field, right? Um, your brain's like, okay, what's going on? 
Now, whether we like it or not, or whether we're good at it or not, that is very energy. It's neurologically taxing and it's energy expending. Uh, it's a, it's a, our brains only run it on about 40 watts of, of power. Um, and task switching takes up a lot of energy, which is why if it happens a lot, we can feel exhausted. It's funny because people ask me <clears throat> why I mean, when we started the pandemic, all of us were quarantined. Okay. We're all in our house, right? doing almost nothing. It feels like we're doing nothing all day, yet we're exhausted. Okay. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons is because we just, we went from a lifestyle where, where we had environments of that siloed environments of activity, right? I'm at home, then I'm in my car, then I go to work and then I, then I'm doing, then I'm at, at the gym and then I'm at home again. Right. It's, and so our brains had, had environments instead of which we could say, okay, now I'm locked into this. Okay. Well, as soon as we're quarantined, all of those contexts got wrapped into one environment, right? So, so I remember I was like, I was writing the book and then suddenly I was helping my son with calculus and then suddenly I was making lunch and then suddenly I was walking the dog and we're like, okay, why am I so exhausted? Well, the reason why is because our brains were switching constantly, you know, going from context to context inside one environment. So it can be, it can be mentally, which turns into physically exhausting. And so is that the, going back to the triggers that we spoke about before that the environmental cues often prime our state for yes. the act that we're going to do. I totally. often talk about this, man. I have never, no matter how good a home gym is, I've never had as good of a workout or lifted as much as I do when you go through the ritual of uh, getting yes. the bag out of the car, saying hello to the receptionist, right. you know, put, choosing the playlist that you're going to listen to or bitching about the playlist that's on in the gym yeah. or whatever. Yeah, you get locked in. You, you, and these are the triggers, right? You, 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 your, your physiological and physical state gets locked into environments, right? This is why I, we used to say it's it's good thing that when we deployed, you know, to go to to go to the, go to war, we weren't coming home every night. It would have been enormously difficult to do that job and have to switch between the two. So chunking I mean, again. Yeah, chunking again. So so we can use these, and so and it's because these environments have also created some some unconscious competence inside of them, right? And when I get into a car, there's a bunch of things I can do in that car without thinking because I'm in that car, right? Same thing at work, same thing at the gym, same thing at home, right? So it, we've we've minimized and made efficient a lot of these tasks that are inside these silos. And as soon as they get wrapped into one environment, we're like, holy shit, you know, I'm, I'm overwhelmed, right? Um, but it, it makes a difference. Okay, so how can people improve their ability to switch between tasks? Like, let's say that someone has a lot of stuff going on. Is there is there anything that you found that works for you? Um, I you know, there. I think I. It's a great question because I'm I'm a little bit you know I would say I'm probably le- I'm a little bit better at task switching than I am at, at compartmentalization in terms of focusing. Um, whereas my wife's the opposite; she can focus and and um, uh, deeply and not and kind of drop everything off. But I would say I would say eliminate eliminate all that stuff that you that doesn't make sense. And then I think a recognition of when you're shifting helps, right? So in other words, if I'm, if I'm doing email, okay, I'm going to do email right now. And then I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to deliberately understand that I'm going to switch from email to talking on the phone or doing something else. I think, a re- I think, I think, I think knowledge I and mean, recogn- recognizing this stuff is, is, is part of the battle. And that's probably what I do. I get, I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm still working on this stuff myself. Um, but I think um, knowing what's happening helps. That because- metacognition. That, yes, totally. And so I think that's that would be my, my one note, I guess. To, to I agree. Reference. I listened to, I can't remember the guy's name. I keep meaning to bring him on the show. Uh, he was on Sam Harris talking about um, what people mean when they say that they are good at multitasking. Yeah. And he said, there's no such thing. There is right. no such thing as multitasking. Right. What people mean by multitasking is parallel processing. You, yes. you, that, that doesn't exist. That's bullshit. What you can do is switch between different tasks very, very quickly. But even that is ridiculously inefficient here's a really cool analogy that he used so he said that um in the same way that that there's a a mathematical model you can use to work out based on where a squirrel is in a tree how many nuts are in the tree and how many nuts are close to that squirrel and how far the next tree away from this from that tree is Mm -hmm. when the squirrel's going to give up looking for nuts in that tree and go on ah interesting so there's a function this it's how much work does this put this person, how much work, this, this man in a squirrel suit, how much work does the man in the squirrel suit have to do to get the next nut? And what's the cost of moving from where he is now to the next place where he might be able to get more nuts more easily? Right. And 
he made an analogy with humans and said that we're in the same way that squirrels and nut foragers were information foragers because for us ancestrally information was such a valuable resource it was the thing that kept us alive we yeah. never had more of it than we needed in fact we probably had a scarcity not a surplus yes and now we've got the reverse now, now we have an abundance rather than a scarcity and yeah. his point is to try and bring constraints in, to focus on single things as much as you can, to mm -hmm. reduce reduce distractions. Another yeah. one that I thought was really interesting to talk about, especially given your background, is discipline. And it's something that after the last year, everyone's looking to develop a little bit more of. What are your insights there? Yeah, I think discipline, the, the important thing is the distinction. And the, there's a distinction between discipline and self-discipline. I talk about discipline holistically. Um, and discipline holistically means the ability to uh, to kind of set and understand the wickets involved to achieve kind of a longer term goal and then move through those effectively to achieve that goal. Um, and those goals, that goal is something that the external world actually has a say in whether or not you achieve. In other words, you're going to have to power through some external. What, what's an example of that? Uh, being a SEAL, writing a book, starting a podcast, uh, becoming a, 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 a surgeon, okay? It's easier if I give the opposite example. Self-discipline are those goals that the external world has no say in whether or not you accomplish. Okay, that would be like I want to lose weight and eat better. Okay, uh, or work out and eat better. Right? I can decide that. I say I'm gonna I'm gonna lose weight and work out and eat better. Right? I decide that, and I could go to the Vegas buffet. Right? And the buffet is not gonna throw pastries at me. Right? It's all on me as to whether or not I achieve that goal. Right? Those types of that's self-discipline. That's those goals that you that only you, the external world, has no say in whether or not you accomplish. Discipline are those goals that um, that you have that the external world does have a say, right? And oftentimes they can now when when balanced, it's very powerful. <clears throat> Someone, however, who might be higher on self-discipline, typically likes routine and likes a you know likes likes a likes a, a kind of a, a scheduled order ordered schedule, right? They, uh, if they're too high on that, overall discipline hurt, is hurt, right? Because whenever you go to achieve a long-term objective that the external world has a say in, um, throw routine out the window because the world is going to hit you with punches all the time. You're going to have to break routine, right? This is why the some of the highly, highly, highly self-disciplined people sometimes have trouble achieving long-term things because it's hard for them to break routine, right? But again, the best is a balance in between. So if you can have, if you can be a little bit self-disciplined and also be disciplined, that's, that's the balance. I love it, man. Yeah. Rich Davini, ladies and gentlemen, the attributes, 25 hidden drivers of optimal performance will be linked in the show notes below. And if they want to go and do their free performance assessment and get all of the tips, they should go to... Yeah, the attributes .com. It's all there. Books there, assessment tools there, workbooks there. Yeah. So, um, and then you can contact me if you want to, if you want to, you know, get consulting or 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 speeches or keynotes or things like that. So, all on the same website. All on the same website. Yeah. Try to make it simple. I love it, dude. So, thanks so much. Thank you, my friend. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few months, and don't forget to subscribe. It makes me very happy indeed. Peace.